Welcome back, everybody, to another live edition of the UFL podcast. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, do we got another big one for you. Uh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to ask before we jump into it, because I didn't do it last time. Let us know if the audio is good. StreamYard, I love you. Come on, give them kisses. But the one thing, they don't have a good audio mixer. So Papa Ref has to guess. So we're going to find out right now. We got an all-star panel. And you might ask yourself why. You probably don't. You already know. It was the UFL dispersal draft, at least phase one and two of the draft. And we're going to go over all the picks. Maybe not every single one of them. But we're going to go over some of the big picks, give our takes, and... I mean, we have some of the biggest names in spring football. Ducky, Ducky, Ducky over to my right. Then we got my man, Zach Kyleman, my regular host. How you doing? Nick Thorne making his debut on the channel. If you ever wanted to know what this handsome fella looks like, there you go. Sign him up. Now you know. And the man of the hour, the blizzard driving fool, James Larson in the house. I can't believe you're awake. I don't know how you're alive. But we yeah, all thank you <laughs> for everything that you did because, I mean, Friday afternoon and going into the late, late night, uh, and not even just you. I mean, a shout out to all of the contributors. I mean, the guys from UFM, credit where credit's due. Uh, we had our man Nicholas Thorne, James Larson over here, uh, UFL analyst. I know there's more out there, so I can't name them all. But, I mean, What's let's like – what I'm sorry, say that again. Illustrated getting the job done too. Oh well, yeah. thank you. Oh, yes, yes, those fellas as well. Can't forget about them. Uh, but here's the real deal. I mean, that's what this community is all about. Is you know getting it done. We you know the last few years, Zach, we were spoiled. We were spoiled because we got the chance to cover the draft live. Fox gave us all the picks as they came in. This was a little bit different situation. We're going to get into that. Uh, I guess uh, we're going to start with you, Nick. I mean, you're new to the show here. Thoughts on the draft. I guess thoughts on the approach on the draft. Like, because, you know, originally it was kind of brought up of, you know, they were going to redraft all the teams. And I think there was a huge sigh of like, you're going to take away the things that made these teams work already. But I think, well, I'm not going to talk. How do you, how do you like the approach, how, how they went about this year? Yeah, I think it's the, best case scenario because it keeps that usfl xfl rivalry going with the separate drafts and then combining for the the like dispersal draft that's upcoming in a, about a week or so um the 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 over like whelming feeling that i get from this is just we really could have used two to four more teams you know you look at some of these depth charts look at like the stallions edge rush group and it's like there's like five or six starters here and it's like, you know, only two of them are going to be the, the guys, the rest will be rotational. I, I just can't help but think like, Oh, you know, I get the financials of it, but that was kind of the main thought was like, these teams are stacked, almost mm -hmm. too stacked, you know? Well, and I, I will say that is kind of the counter argument to it is now we have essentially 16 teams mashed into eight and when the when the ufl goes out there and says that they're the premier spring football league i mean it there's almost no doubt about it because you know if you look back on this previous drafts i remember zach when we were covering them as we we're announcing names there was a lot of people in the chat that weren't sure some of them were from smaller schools some of them hadn't played in a while with this draft everybody knew every name because they were all blockbuster players on all of the teams that you know unfortunately didn't make the cut um, I'm curious, and we'll go round round the table on this one here. What are your thoughts on how they did the the draft? Where if you were in the USFL conference, you were stuck choosing from that pool of players. Where and then the XFL, you know, is kind of stuck in that pool at least until the the phase three on the fifteenth. Yeah, well, if you're gonna go, I'll kick things off, and I mean. I don't mind it. I actually think it's a solid way of doing the setup because you do at least have on the back end, you're going to have everybody eventually mashed into one pool. But, you know, given how they have come out and basically without fully telling us this in PRs that they're trying to incentivize essentially rivalry per conference is how I'm looking at it. 
this is kind of the first step in doing so is keeping your talent versus your talent in place is how I've viewed it since they began the two phases of this beginning three phase draft. Uh, eventually we will get everybody left over into one big pile to fill out the 75, but for now, not a bad start. And I think it keeps a bun at least keeps kind of that flow and mentality of some of the guys you already know in your conferences where you can kind of have more, I think readily available information to decipher and scout guys that you've already seen in those conferences from coaches that have been there for at least a season to two seasons max. So not a bad way to start gives them more time for after you get the people you know are great to then look at what's remaining and then get extra scouting out for the rest of that draft pool sorry zach i'm just laughing at the comment that i put on the screen that oh, ducky yes. is a bama fan no. uh ducky give your answer to the question but also before you do explain to the folks what's going on here i mean ohio state's your thing man not not a bama fan just uh figured i'd Try something different one. <laughs> See how good I look in crimson red instead of scarlet red. Mm. I, I, I got to say it works for you. Although I think you should be wearing some maize and blue, but you know, we'll get there one of these days sooner or later. Uh, so anyway, what, what are your thoughts on the format? Uh, you know, XFL picking from the XFL, USFL picking from the USFL. What do you uh, got? I like it. It definitely, it, it creates that rivalry between mm -hmm. the conferences. So that's the biggest thing I take away from it. It's, You'll still have the USFL guys on the USFL side and the XFL guys on the XFL side. Right. And I think the fans will like that as well because, you know, Twitter, everybody's arguing about which one's better. Right. Now we'll right. still get to see which one's better. I can't wait. I can't wait. Like I said, we, we get we get a chance to right away to kick off the season, which I'm going to take a moment here to talk about spring stock three. Thank they you. say everything's bigger in Texas including spring stock three and if you didn't know we're heading to arlington texas for the big show march 30th arlington texas more details will be shared in the coming weeks but i do have a promo to share because i did load it in here you know what i'm going to use the new tools so everybody sit back relax if you got some popcorn sign you up if you don't it's going to be over before you go get it so enjoy <laughs> That is right. Spring stock three. You don't want to miss it. You want to head to Arlington, Texas. Like I said, we're going to be sharing details soon on the location where you can find us. But you know, this is the third one. It's the biggest kickoff party and pregame show and tailgate of the spring. Not even just of the weekend of the spring. You don't want to miss it. We're going to have some big guests. You know what they say? Good guests, good times and giveaways thanks to our sponsor vintage varsity go check them out you want some uh licensed showboats gear you want a captain's hat go get them signed up we'll have a link down in the description and like i said stay tuned for more information on spring stock three which again kind of segues into what i was just saying here spring stock three opening weekend we have a chance the xfl champions versus the usfl champions the birmingham stallions the Arlington Renegades, and then again at the end of the season with the championship. We'll, we'll see which conference has it. So I didn't want to derail too much, but I had to share that spring stock promo uh, because, you know, I like to toot my own horn sometimes. James, what are your thoughts on the format? Go back into the discussion here. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of on the same line as everybody else. I thought it was a great idea. Once we kind of learned that they were going to do that a couple weeks ago, I was like, this is sick. Like, this is what they should have done. You know, like Ducky said, the rivalry. Now we get to see which league is quote unquote better. And now we also get to continue that, you know, as this league builds five, 10, 15 years down the road, we can have these discussions about not only which teams are the best, but which conferences are the best and which conference should you be playing for, uh, you know, as a player. So I think it'll be re really interesting to watch it all unfold. And like you said, this big opening kickoff weekend, we got Arlington and Birmingham, the two champions, and it'll be interesting to see. You know, with with how this draft played out, we had Lindsey Scott get picked up by Arlington. We've seen Adrian Martinez signed a signed a contract with the Stallions. 
Might be some new faces there at the QB position, but either way, we got the two best teams going at it, so it'll be fun to watch. Right on. Final thoughts, Nick? Yeah, I mean, kind of like what I said earlier, uh, I, th- I think everyone kind of hit it on the head with, you know, keeping them separate. And I'll also kind of just add on that, like, there's still a lot of talent left in the dispersal draft. Like, y- you know, one, if, if you're of the thought that one conference has better talent than the other, that's kind of going to go away. Because there's, yeah, I'm looking at, like, my list of guys who didn't get protected or didn't get drafted and, there's a lot of really good players still left on the board. There's going to be a lot of talent that are, you know, have still yet to find a team. 100%. I mean, we really yeah. are potentially looking at what could be the greatest season of spring football coming up. When we are mashing, we are creating mega spring football teams here. Uh, sorry, Zach, I didn't mean to cut you off. It sounded like you might have had a thought there. No, I just thought it was a perfect segue to something that the chat's bringing up. Okay. And I think it's a great discussion for our panel is, uh, does the draft with how saturated the talent pool is incentivize us specifically wanting to have more teams involved in the league? I see a few people in the chat already bring it up. This is why we should have had 12 or should have had 10. And I don't know. It's a good, I think it's a good debate because I think on one side, I love it because you saturate all the teams with really great, talented guys. makes the competition a lot more uh, upbeat, a lot more competitive, a lot more exciting football. But I can see where people also are going, where I'm also going, where you guys all go in this mm-hmm. chat, where more players have more jobs, more teams are involved. I'd love to hear from all of you. Like I said, there's a few people in here asking about this, and I think that's something that comes up with uh, more of this discussion as we go along in these three phases. Well, I guess I'll start, right? Uh, here, here's my take. I think... I think the hope is, and I don't, I won't say goal, but I think the hope is, is that this inaugural UFL season or season three of the USFL or season two of the XFL, however you want to look at it. I think the hope is that is it's enough of a success to where similar to what we saw with the USFL in season one, they instantly come back and say, season two is on the way, like the day after the championship game. Now, if you do that, then I think that affords you a little bit of breathing room because if we all look back what feels like years ago, but it was really just a couple months ago, it sounded like the USFL was actively in talks with different locations in Louisiana. So, you know, maybe they couldn't get it locked down this year, but maybe they do get it locked down next year and we see the return of the breakers. Then do we see, I mean, then, then there's all sorts of different questions is then do the roughnecks go to the XFL division and you bring in, you know, it, it, you have a little bit of wiggle room here to make things make a little bit more sense. Um, I, I'm, I mean, there's no guarantee on what's going to happen. I think we need to see how everything plays through, but I mean, just looking at the rosters and that's what we're here kind of here to talk about. I feel like these teams are all going to play good. And I, I think the other piece of it that works well is in phase one, all of the coaches had a chance to protect those 42 players keep the players, uh, allow them to return to the team that they gelled with, grew synergy with over the last maybe one or two seasons to where you don't lose that. Because that, as we all know, is the one thing is any new spring football league, it's like three weeks, three weeks before you really know what these teams are going to be like. There's, you know, I I won't go too much further into it because I'm taking over the show. Uh, I guess who wants to go next on this subject? I, I can jump in here. Um, one kind of thought I keep coming back to when it comes to the like eight, 10, 12 discussion. Mm-hmm. And like, again, I, I understand the financials of it all, but um, I think to the DC defenders last year and last year coming into it, they drafted really well. Von Hunches did a great job, but at wide receiver, they had three picks and three duds to start out. They had Jaquez Ezzard who got cut mid season they had um, Katie Cannon and they had um, uh, Jazz Ferguson, who's still on the roster, but those two got mm-hmm. hurt in camp. And suddenly there was an opportunity to, you know, have other people step up. And 11th round pick Lucky Jackson and camp signing Chris Blair step up. And then suddenly they're in NFL camps. They're getting, they're making teams. Um, they're hopefully signing futures deals soon, you know. Mm-hmm. I, it, it just gives you some opportunities at the fringes of guys who would have been a complete afterthought to step up. And with this league, it's the p- football is going to be really good, but 
it's a lot of known quantities and I'm, I, I'm really excited. I, one of the things I enjoy watching in spring football is the new guy, the new quarterback right. and that's never gotten a snap before. I want to see new guys funnel through. And I think it's just a little harder with 18. Yeah, no, I get you there. Now, you know, speaking of the DC defenders, James, you posted something on X earlier. You X posted on X earlier uh, about Dear King, maybe potentially making a return to the DC defenders. Now he wasn't in this draft. He didn't say uh, well, uh, a letter of interest or a letter of intent rather. Sorry. Uh, he has a, a, a different role currently, so it would have to be kind of miraculous. Now I'm curious, what do you think the, the chances are of something like this happening? I know this is purely speculation. Just if anybody knows speculation zone, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, De'Ara King made that comment saying, I'm coming back, which makes everybody think that, yeah, he's coming back. But there's so much to look at behind the scenes logistically, because for one, like you said, he wasn't in the draft pool. So if he was to come back, it would have to be after the 15th. He had to sign as a free agent. But then secondly, you know, the point that Mike Mitchell brings up is that he is currently going to be coach helping coaching at SMU. You know, that's going to be going on. They're going to have some spring season there. There's going to be overlap. So how is that going to work? Will SMU be flexible? Will they let him play? That's a whole thing in and of itself. You know, I, I think it's one of those situations where let's let's see where Jordan Tamu goes, right? I mean, right, that's a guy right. that I really think, you know, has that spot, has the starting spot in D.C. if he comes back. Um, so he's the guy that obviously he spent time with the Vikings this year. He's not in either draft pool because he didn't sign a letter of intent. He didn't. He wasn't in that pool. But, I mean, come on. I mean, if Jordan Tom, who's the offensive player of the year, if he came back, I feel like he'd be the obvious starter in D.C. Oh, 100%. I, I agree. Now, I, I do want to shift a little bit here and, and talk about some of the picks in the draft. Now, I'm going to say this. Now, and this is not coming from bias. Not at all. Not one bit. But I got to say, the Houston Roughnecks really went all in on this draft. I mean, I can't. <laughs> I look at this list of players. Mark Thompson, we already know. He's going to rough them up. Wide, receive, re, wide receivers, Anthony Ratliff-Williams, we got him. T.O. Redding, we got him. Cyril Grayson, Justin Hall. Anything is possible, Isaiah Henny. I mean, tight ends? You were talking about this earlier, Nick. Dude, our tight end room is ridiculous. Clint Sig Jr., Braden Bowman, Woody Brandom, Ryan Izzo. I mean, stacked. This team. And... I want to say that, you know, it's going to be a fluke if they go 12 and out, but we already know they're going to rough them up. They're going all in. The name doesn't matter, but the competition is going to be fierce because I'll tell you, do you know who I'm scared of, of all the teams right now? I'm not even going to lie. The showboats, the showboats. Thank you. John D. Filippo. Sign that man up. I mean, Case he, Cookus, <sighs> Darius Victor, DeAndre Overton, Kennedy Brooks, Jonathan Adams, Vontae Diggs. I can go on. Jerry Elder. It's insane. It is. I mean, <laughs> he he really did, I feel like, win this draft. Now, again, we still have phase three coming up. I, I'm curious, though. Uh, We'll go around the table. I guess, Ducky, we'll start with you. You're you're teamless. You have no bias here. Uh, I mean, kind of looking at the picks, who do you think? I, I don't I guess I'll say this. Do you think there's any team that made a statement in this first two phases of the draft? Oh, you're muted. Or you're getting no audio. Roughnecks and yeah, hey. that was on my end. Roughnecks and the showboats, like how you were saying. But I knew the second you said unbiased that you were about to say the most biased thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's my journal my journalist integrity. I can't be biased. So when I say that the roughnecks are going twelve and zero in 2024 and they're gonna rough them up, you know that that's just a fact. It's the truth. So anyway, Zach, who, what do you think here? Who's making a statement? Who won? I mean, what are your what are some picks that are blowing your mind, I guess, here too? Well, I'm glad everyone's bringing Memphis up because that to me is one is not only one of the best drafts that I've seen, but it addresses all their needs. It's the most well-rounded, I think, of all all of the pieces. Keep in mind, Memphis was already a pretty defensive studded unit last year. It's one of the reasons they were able to recover and go five and five. 
But the fact that they picked up Case Cookus, they got back some really excellent talent from the breakers that John Filippo wanted to have back. Getting Vinny Bapali on your side as well back in Memphis was a great getup. And some of those pickups from the line from the New Jersey Generals, keep in mind the Generals offensive line was arguably one of, if not the top O-line in the USFL the last two seasons. Terry Poole going over there is a great selection. I love the pickup. It ha- it goes and it addresses everything that they were weakest on and still makes them overall come out much better than they were. Definitely was one of my favorite drafts. I also got a shout-out. I'm not going to say the Panthers. I will say an honorable mention. I like the Panthers draft for some of the flashy pieces. Getting Corey Coleman, by the way with hopefully EJ Perry sticking around for the long haul here when it comes back, when you get the chance is great. Uh, if not Davis cheek being as backup is a great selection on that side too. But you know, Coleman, Jordan Sewell, Devin gray, and they pretty much adapted Bart Andrus's receiving core to take that one to the next level. And on the XFL side, I mean, I'm really, I really like some of these solid pickups in terms of looking at the battle Hawks. They just got stronger. I mean, Anything that had Jacor Pearson on, we were waiting to see where he would go. That was going to be one of the big shoes to drop. He goes over to the Battle Hawks. Now, they do have, of course, a quarterback situation they're going to have to talk about a little bit. But beyond that, whoever's throwing to Pearson, Pearson is one of the, you could say, one of the top five prospects in the UFL right now getting the spot. Keep in mind, the XFL side, top leader in yards in the XFL side. So easily one of the top fives, arguably the best receiver in this in this current league. Uh, I love that stuff. Plus, they also got Blake Jackson coming over, too. I mean, you got to name it. I got the Battle Hawks on the radar right now, and Battle Hawks fans are going to be building up the Battle Dome and rocking it out. Just depends on the QB. Another honorable mention for the from the XFL side, looking for Lindsey Scott. He's one of those guys a lot of people wanted to see what he can do this year. Um, and, hey, Arlington gets a uh, unique quarterback battle between him and Luis Perez, something I'm watching all offseason. You know, if they show a bowling promo, you got to go for Luis Perez. You have to make a new one. That's all I'm saying. Make another one. That's all I'm saying. Um, I feel like I had a point and then I lost the point. So I'll move on to you, Nick. Uh, Thoughts on, you know, who won the draft? Who made a statement? What do you got for us? Yeah, I I think obviously Memphis, Houston, Michigan, you look at those teams that it's pretty self-explanatory that they had some solid drafts. One team that I don't see talked about as much and it's par- partially because like they, they didn't have like a flashy draft is San Antonio. Yeah. Um, I now obviously taking 18 Houston Roughnecks uh, out of 20 possible players, they clearly just kind of took the team and moved it to San Antonio for the most part. Mm-hmm. But doing that, I, I think, you know, you look at the roster, it's, it's pretty good right now for what they want to do. Cody Latimer as a tight end in a run and shoot, system like as that wide receiver tight end hybrid is fun um you know adding justin smith to that receiving core Cade warner uh son of uh kurt um into that receiving room added a bunch of uh defensive players too from the um the roughnecks and the one thing that i i really noticed and i'm curious about um i'd love to get clarity on is kirk ben kurt they um they protected him and he said he was retired a few months ago. So I don't know if that means he was retired from the NFL and that he's still going to do the spring football thing as a side gig or not. If they got him, you know, I like Jack Cohn more than most. And I think in a better system, he could actually flourish. But Kirk Benkert is a, you know, a high upside quarterback in, in a league like this. Something I want to point out about that, Nick, is the fact that Kurt originally was going to play for the Roughnecks. Yeah. And then we had that midseason trade where he got to San Antonio because the Brahmas desperately needed a quarterback. They had all those injuries, all those issues going on. And Kurt went in there. And then, of course, unfortunately, Kurt got injured himself. But mm-hmm. I think what makes this situation very fascinating is that we saw all of the Houston Roughnecks personnel, you know, Wade Phillips, AJ Smith, all those guys, they hopped over to San Antonio, which is where Kurt Benkert was. And I feel like that had to play a role in why he was protected. And you have to imagine that Wade and A.J. Smith and Mark Lillibridge and all those guys are talking to Benker like, hey, come play for us. You know, you wanted to do it already back in 2023. Now you have the opportunity to do it again. You know, let's rock and roll here in 2024. Of course, nothing's confirmed on that end yet. But the fact that they protected him definitely tells you something, that there there's something going on on that end with Benker. Yeah, and they're at least at minimum interested. And yeah, if he's waffling on the fact of coming back, you lock it down. He comes in and he plays. Now, and here, uh, here is the, oh, go on. Sorry. 
Yeah, I just had one more thing to add in. Yeah, yeah. That adds the intrigue to that too. The reason he didn't play for the Roughnecks was he wanted to spend time with his family in like the early part of last year. The season got pushed back. So I wonder if that also could potentially be uh, another reason why he decided that this time around he's actually going to go for it. Right on, right on. Yeah. Very much so, hopefully, because I'd love to see him out on the field. Um, so this is this is what I was going to bring up earlier, Zach, when you were talking about the Battle Hawks. You mentioned, you know, they kind of have a dicey situation at quarterback right now. James, earlier you brought up Tayamu. He's not in D.C. yet. He's not He's not in the draft pool at all. Now, I wonder, uh, and again, speculation zone, you know if they brought Tamu back to St. Louis, that dome would be rocking when they played a game in there. I mean, he played great for D.C. last year. You bring him into St. Louis as a free agent. Again, this is all pending. He might have, He might decide not to come to the UFL this year. But I almost wonder if there's some discussions there, and that's why we're seeing them go light at QB. Or we could... Again, we still have uh, the 15th where it opens everything up, right? Then any you can pick anybody from any league, whether you're USFL conference, XFL conference. So maybe there's somebody in the mix there that they have their eye on as well. Uh, but I wanted to throw that in the mix. It's more of, again, a speculative note. Um, I don't know. I, do you think Te'amu would go back? I guess where do you think he, has, uh, he would go back to? I mean, he just came from D.C. on... They went to the championship game. So that's kind of tough to turn down, but the dome is the dome, man. And, uh, I mean, you know, it has to feel good having 30 plus thousand people behind you at every home game. I don't know. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Hopes, wishes, uh, or I guess the opposite on if that happens. <laughs> hmm. What do you think, James? That's a good, that's a good discussion point. I do. <coughs> I'll lead off with this for you personally. I think DC just because of the recency and being in the system going back is where I tie it in. But the fascinating part of this QB discussion in particular is that I think you got a lot of rosters waiting to see where some of these, as Nick has mentioned, futures and other reserve deals go, because then we can talk about completely free open market post draft and then leave those slight bits of roster spots open for those really key pieces. Like say if a McCarran slides back out or a Tom who slides back out, Hey, I got a contract for you right here, ready to sign on the dotted line. That's where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious too. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Like how many, like, I don't want to call them last minute signings because that's not really how I want to position it, but signings after the draft that we're going to see right with the USFL, I was actually surprised at the number of signings that they made, not necessarily right before the season, but even during the season, Bo Scarborough let's not forget came, I think halfway through season one. Uh, and there was a few other players in that in the mix there as well. So it'd be, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out, especially for the fact that you kind of have a little bit more room out, right? You're not playing right after the super bowl. Um, I don't know any thoughts on, on anything. I, I mean, we, I think we went through the gauntlet. I know that the, the college football championships about to start soon. So I don't want to roll too much over if we don't have to, uh, but I guess I'll ask the chatter. If anybody here has discussion, we can go through the round table, but everybody in the chat, is there anything you want us to discuss? Is there any pick that you want us to go over? Um, any thoughts, anything, drop it in the chat. We'll discuss it. And I guess we'll do a round table on, I guess just overall thoughts on everything, or if there's any discussions that you want to go over. Well, I will say ref is I didn't get to talk about the rosters yet on my end. No, so. sign you up. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of got this track with Jordan. Yeah. Tamu. Um, I, going back to your question of who do I think won the draft? I mean, obviously everybody covered Memphis and Houston already. I do think that Michigan was underrated. Just looking at who they grabbed, like Zach mentioned, Corey Coleman. I mean, he led the league in receiving yes. yards last year. He's just an incredible talent, but look at who else they picked up. They got Matt Colburn. They got Wes Hills, the guy who just set the rushing record in the modern USFL over from new Orleans. They picked up Davis cheek, but a guy that we're not talking about enough is Danny Etling. I mean, he's mm. was protected. Mm -hmm, he yeah. signed on Christmas Eve, actually. Um, and that's a guy that if EJ Perry doesn't come back, Etling's a guy that could definitely go into that starting position. So you've got a ton of depth there. And let's look at some of the def defenders Michigan picked up. They got Bryce Tornadin. They, you know, that's a guy that was just mm -hmm. phenomenal for Pittsburgh the last couple of years. Special teams, Brock Miller, Jordan Ober, two of the best in the business from New Jersey. I feel like across the board, Michigan had one of the most complete drafts of any team. 
And then to kind of bounce back to the uh, the XFL, Arlington, they got Vic Beasley. I mean, that this guy is still around. He's still kicking it. And I, I really think that Bob Stoops kind of has that power to, to attract some of those big names. And I think it'll be interesting, interesting to see what happens here. Like you mentioned, this upcoming free agency tentatively set to open up the 16th. I know of a couple names that I can't name right now. But there's some big names that are really interested in playing in the league, and it's going to be very fascinating to watch where they end up once all this dust settles. Well, if they know what's good for them, they'll all come to the Roughnecks because we're going 12 and 0, and we're going to rough them all up. Yeah, you know, I, I can't I help was waiting for I that. I can't help <laughs> myself. It, it was a layup. You you threw the <laughs> you were ready. For Sometimes that. I say that to my wife, and she doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> She'd be like, cook a breakfast. And she'd be like, you know what? I'm like, yeah, the Roughnecks are going 12-0 and 0 in 2024. She'd be like, what? I'm like, oh, nothing. I just want butter well, on my toast. Well, you, you know what? <laughs> to, 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 flip the, to flip it back, James, thanks for being competent in my Panthers. Because I, I didn't want to, unlike the ref here, I didn't want to go full bore and go, oh, Michigan <laughs> is going to just, it's such a great draft. It's easily the best. Um, but, yeah, I'm I mean, look, You got to shout you. out Steve Kazor, man. Steve Kazor, the I GM. Know. Mike he, Nolan. He's been they, they yeah. got some big guys. They got some big names. Now, Steve was doing his work. I got to tell you, uh, the, the, like I said, Shalom Luani, when you see him pop up on the screen, like, dude, I'm telling you, I love, I love aggressive headhunting safeties like guys like him. I will gladly take that. Obviously, uh, my <laughs> Mike Nolan gladly will too, being the defensive head coach that uh, he is. I will say, though, the ref, because this was brought up in uh, R.J. Young's piece on the draft and his own uh, first preseason power ranking, by the way, um, the Houston Roughnecks have the most all uh, any talent between the two leagues at nine, three more than any other team in the league. Uh, next closest would be, I believe, six, and that's two of the teams have six. Just wait to you see. Top. Just wait till the end of the season. It's going to be like all of them. Anyway, sorry. It's be everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be the all USFL or UFL team. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. You know, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. I'm just telling. I'm telling you. I, I'm, I'm excited. But I'll tell you something else with this draft because we got the super draft now. By the way, mm -hmm. the super draft. Love the naming. Got it. It's not just a draft. It's the super draft. I like that. And you know what? You know me. I'm a big branding guy, and I wish I would have thought of that first. A super not, draft, not the Super Bowl. The no, super draft. The super. That's draft. why I loved. Not <laughs> to take us off on a, baby. <laughs> not to take us on a tangent, but I'll be honest. That's why I loved the Mega Bowl. <laughs> like I always thought the Spring League Mega Bowl was the funniest thing because it's like you know the Wish.com version. Like no, no, no. We have the Super Bowl at home, and it's the Mega Bowl. That's you know. That's the equivalent of a TV or movie's name for a championship being yeah. slapped on in real life. You're like, nah, this can't be real. This was in like, this is like in the water boy or something, right? No. Yeah, nah, <laughs> exactly. <is> real <laughs> exactly. I guess, you know, uh, we, we kind of talked about our, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking through the chat here, seeing if anybody has, so somebody said ranking the rosters. I mean, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough to do it, but you know what? Let's try. Number one, Ooh. we already know Houston Roughnecks. So who's number two? <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's hard because right, let, let's give it to the right michigan in. panthers because then at least zach has the second you know ducky he doesn't have a team yet i'm switzerland i'm not picking sides and i i don't know what, what nick who do you root for i'm dc okay oh yeah yeah no i i i'm aware <laughs> i'm aware of that one <laughs> I, I would defensively the roughnecks have it defensively Dude, the roughnecks I, I do have a, a good argument. defense yeah well, and that's we had to because you can't have a, a phrase like rough them up if you don't have a strong defense. I mean, you kind of have to. It's kind of like the defenders should have a good defense too because like if they ever got walloped like the like the the showboats did last year 42 to 2, you know, and newsroom included, that would be there would be a pun in the headline about the defenders and their defense. There would be something in there that would be made. I would make sure of it as the owner of this dang thing um not that i'm <laughs> i don't really am not i'm not important so when i say i'm the owner of newsroom don't <laughs> don't don't be impressed oh, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my. but i do have a good time doing it i mean i wouldn't have met any of you guys if i never, didn't start this website almost six years ago which leads me to our kind of next dis well not next discussion but well yeah Go on. Come, what do you got come around for the, me? Come around, Ben. I actually want to throw in because we, you know, I know you put in the roughnecks. You got your your bid. We've all talked Memphis. 
Um, I think between the draft and still what has been uh, present and accountable for on all these teams, my money's still on Birmingham. I know that they aren't. We didn't talk about them, but I mean, I Jack still like their pick. I was about to bring them up. Right? They're not. I mean, yeah. Again, another like I think James, you brought it up. Another not like flashy draft. Like I'm not. No one's gonna sit here as a as a normie or anyone and go, "Wow, that was a freaking crazy draft." And I don't even think of it that way. But the guys they grabbed, it makes sense what they fill in to make this a team that already was championship caliber. I mean, keep in mind, Mark. Marcus Ball is a hell of a tight end in his own right, joining with Jim with Jay Sternberger, more of a blocking type too than I think Sternberger is, and that's good for their setup for whoever's behind center running the ball. Meanwhile, Calvin Ashley, I mean, come on, dude. That's one of the best offensive linemen in this whole league going over there, and they already had a solid line (laughs) defensively. Hercules Matafa. Holy crap. Andre St. Amour, who also had his own solid moments last year. Chris Orr in the linebacking court. (laughs) Stripling in the defensive secondary with Eli Walker, mind you. And Chris Blewett replacing Brandon Aubrey. I mean, that's a pretty uh, good trade-off, and Ducky knows that for damn sure because that's Mm -hmm. (laughs) got a few of those Mullers guys on that roster. That's one, yeah, not a flashy draft, but they didn't need it to be too flashy. That roster's already pretty freaking good. I'd say even more if it wasn't YouTube. I'm just being safe. (laughs) Well, I think you bring up a great point, Zach, because speaking of Zach's, Zach Potter, I mean, he's probably the most brilliant GM in the game right now. The 22-year-old, my age, he's won back-to-back chips with a team. My God. But I think their approach to this draft, too, is the fact that they know that they're going to be able to pick up some of the guys that they weren't able to protect here in this January 15th draft. And I feel like that's the route that they're going because they did unprotect some really talented guys, some guys that helped them win a championship either one year or two years in a row. So I feel like the like uh, I'm looking at Luke Miller's tweet right here, right? And they only mm-hmm. picked up 12 guys, and they could have picked up 20. Mm-hmm. So I think that goes to show that they're leaving some extra roster spots open because they want to fill it in with some of those guys that they couldn't protect because they were maxed out at 42. Mind you, Birmingham had signed. They had over 60 guys on their roster heading into Phase 1 and Phase 2. So it's some, that's something to keep an eye on in this upcoming dispersal draft. I see Zach Potter looking to get back a lot of those guys. But yeah, Zach, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, just the guys that they were able to get, it was more of quality over quantity, I feel like, is what Zach Potter was going for here. And uh, like the the rich get richer is really what it is. (laughs) Yeah. I think if you compare draft versus roster, and I I see Nick's gearing up, so I'm not going to take too much more time. But my thing, my thing is. Draft wise, we definitely I think I'm going with Memphis's best draft because it fills the most stuff that they were missing overall. I think as roster goes, I'm still leaning Birmingham, Arlington not too bad, and I think DC if they get Tom or someone else back that is of a quality like that, you can't knock the defenders off either. So there are options, but Birmingham overall I think still is the top for me. Memphis goes for the best draft at least in terms of pieces that fill so many gaps and elevates that roster to what was missing already and is now not. Yeah, and the going back to the Stallions, the point I was going to make there is uh, they kind of already had their dispersal draft before the dispersal draft with free agency. I mean, you look at the additions mm-hmm. they this offseason. Amari Rogers, Victor Bolden, Benjamin Victor, Gary Jennings, just that wide receiver. You know, uh, Carlo Kemp, uh, Keava Tizino, Kenny oh, Robinson yeah. for the uh, old 2020 XFL fans, Curtis Weaver. Uh, uh, Neville Clark. I mean, the, the list just goes on of like legit great additions, and some of the guys that you know have been in spring football before, but they just uh, while everyone was waiting to see what was happening, the, uh, Birmingham just went after it and just signed every person they could. And you see now that they've you know they could only protect forty two of them, and they've got a very tight forty two where it's like, yeah, I don't know who the next person you'd cut from that forty two is because it's hard. So talented, you know, teams like um, the, uh, the the Roughnecks, they didn't have that many players. And it was like they had six offensive linemen coming into this, which uh, they did great at the offensive line position, which is why I was so happy with their draft, getting uh, Shamari Skillmore, Paul Adams, getting some guys there. Um, but they didn't have a ton of tough decisions to make um, because they just – weren't cutting that many people and Birmingham had to cut 25. I mean, the worst was San Antonio. They had to cut 36 guys unprotected. Yeah. Um, now it's a new staff, so it's a little bit less hard, but um, you know, it, it, Birmingham had like a really good roster coming into it. So they just kind of were able to just take a few guys. And uh, yeah, I think just like you said, you know, you look at like a Bo Scarabo, you look at, um, you know, some of their secondary guys, Christian McFarlane, 
I, I'd imagine they let those guys go because I think they might be able to get them back and mm-hmm. that they're like super high value with guys who've been hurt and, you know, older vet types that might not go right away in a dispersal draft situation. Right on. I mean, Birmingham, they always seem to find a way. I know we've talked about it a lot. I mean, season one, there was a lot of people that kind of chalked it up to, well, every game was played in Birmingham, home team advantage. But then you go to season two, you know, they, they share the hub still, but half the games are still away and 14 injuries and they still only lose one extra game. They win the championship again. And I mean, I wouldn't doubt any, what any of you guys are saying here. Uh, it's going to be unfortunate when they go into the playoffs at best with an eight and two record and lose to the roughnecks after losing to us twice in the season. Uh, but you know, that's just how the, the way things go. But you know, if, if anybody could beat the roughnecks, you know, again, man, that our, the USFL division is looking scary between the showboats, the roughnecks, the stallions, those three alone are, <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be some tight competition. It's going to be t- some tight competition. I mean, anywhere you look at it, this league, we've talked about it early in the episode. We talked about it in the middle of it and we'll talk about it at the end as well. Uh, <laughs> these teams are flipping stacked. We haven't yeah. even gotten to the 15th to where the, the, the rest of the draft kicks off where anybody can pick from the remaining, uh, the remaining pool from any, any conference, if you will. And then like we talked about early, earlier, free agency, that kind of opens up the door to, Names that we don't even know that are interested or maybe even guys that are returning that weren't in the pool for one reason or another, like, uh, not Perez, but Tamu, right? Uh, either way, this is shaping up to be a fun year of spring football. I'm excited. I, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I brought it up before. I wasn't sure going into this merger. There was highs. There was lows. There was times I was happy. There was times I was nervous. There was times I was worried. But after seeing the push from the social teams, which sign them up, sign up the social teams. They're putting in hard work over there. Sign everybody up that's doing anything over at the league because, I mean, we are getting daily content. We're getting uh, like an information drive. And this seems to be par for the course. If we look at last year, the year before, what was Fox's MO? First of the year, and it's like news overload. And here we are now. And, I mean, it's not official that – Houston's going to play at Rice Stadium, but it basically is. So we know that announcement's around the corner. We know schedules are coming soon. It's been reported around the middle of the month, around the 15th. I'm not going to say an exact date because I'll be honest, I don't want to be wrong. Uh, But around that time, that's what it sounds like. And if it's a little bit later, I mean, sue me, get over it. Uh, But you would assume, you would assume that we would have all the locations by the time the schedule comes out any of the markets that aren't actively selling tickets and are still doing reserves, you would hope that the, the tickets probably go on sale uh, around the same time, if not the same time, which would you would think would lead us to some type of news next week on all of this, but speculation zone, we'll have to see, but hopefully, hopefully we do, because I'll tell you this, if they're not playing at TDECU, I have to reselect my seat yeah. and I got to make sure I get that 50 yard line seat. Now I don't want front row. You guys can have front row. I want like row seven through 10. So stay away from seven through 10 aisle. I want the aisle seat because I like to get up. You've heard my demands. Now stay away from my seats until after I select them, then sit all around me. You could be like the guy. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I was at the roughnecks game last season and I was on Twitter okay. and somebody tagged me in a post and said, this guy looks just like you. And it was me. And so for a while I had to look around <laughs> to try to find who was taking pictures of me and tagging me. And I finally found him. I was like, it is me. <laughs> it was, I liked it. I, some might think that's weird and creepy. I enjoyed it. I was like, I looked, I showed my wife. I was like, there's somebody here taking pictures of us. And I was like, that's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, you know me, I'll get us way off subject. I I've got a great l- next one here because Thank it's going to lead into phase two and beyond guys. Any, anyone that we felt like was a uh, miss for phase one. I, some people, do you think there's someone that you sh- should have thought was going to get picked up already? I got a few of them in terms of the QB position. I know it's a little hairy with uh, maybe you're balancing that position, but uh, I'm waiting to see where Quentin Dormady goes, by the way. Uh, that's a name floating out there. I was actually surprised to see that DeAndre Francois went before him. Mm. Um, personal opinion, but you know everyone's got their own take. 
But I want to hear what else you guys think is um, some guys that aren't being picked up. The chat actually brought a few up from the USFL side, like Joe Walker, Trey Williams, Bailey Gaither. Uh, let's hear it. Where we got Ducky? What do you? Th- who do you think? Uh, not a per- not a particular person per se, but special teams in general. I feel like hmm. was just completely missed out on because a lot of those guys got cut be- because the skill players are getting picked yeah. up. So yeah, I think a lot of people missed out there with getting some good special teams guys. Well, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm surprised Marquette King didn't get picked up. Now, again, we still have one more phase of this, and maybe it is something like, okay, we're going to lock these guys down. We know we can probably get special teams in the in the later phase, so it, there could be I, – I, I expect to see a little bit more of special teams picked up. Or maybe they know they, they can skip the draft and just sign them after the fact. Marquette King, though, I was surprised because – Marquette was protected by Arlington. Oh, yes. he was. He was. Okay, mm-hmm. good. Well, I saw him on, on X the other day. He he put out an X post uh, talking about it, and somebody brought it up. So, oh, good. I You know what? My eyes deceived me. Good. Then that sign was, us that, up. That's one I'm happy that, that still is around. That's a personality. Uh, the, the league like this needs personalities, and both of the sides had those folks on each one. So I'm glad that he's definitely there to be someone that not, not only is a great player, but is also a great social uh, person in person and on social media. Right on Ducky. It feels like you have a comment here. James, check this word really quick. I feel like you should talk about that. Oh, mm. Derek King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Derek King just followed us up here. You know, he, he had that comment of him saying I'm coming back. And then we just recently left a comment on the, on a similar post saying that he was joking. So, okay. Let's, All right. We'll have to see how that one shakes out. That's we'll kind of a cruel see. joke. If it is a joke, he might be trolling. <laughs> I mean, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of trolling the past few days, actually the past few months from all sorts of different spring football players. I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are. <laughs> um, and so we'll see. And you know, a, a storyline that I thought went a little under the radar today, Toby Johnson ending up yeah. in Houston. Thank you. Yes. Like yes. what yeah. in the world? Like that was just a whole to do in and of itself because he wasn't notified. I don't know how you don't notify the two time all USFL defensive tackle. One of the best guys in the league, but he didn't know until after the league's posted. And I, you know, it is what it is. It's how it went down, but he was pretty frustrated with that. And, uh, you know, over the past few hours, has that too changed? And now it looks like he's excited to play for the Roughnecks. So now you got Toby Johnson and Chris Odom coming back. Uh, it's it's insane. Not to mention all the other names they picked up as well. Adam Rodriguez, Gabriel Sewell. It's it's ridiculous what the Roughnecks did. Yeah, well, you know why he changed his tune? Sorry, Zach, real quick. I slid yeah. into his DMs and I reminded him oh my God. that you were just drafted by a team that's going to go 12-0 and 0 in 2024. We're going to rough him up. Instant ring. He sent me smiley face. This actually didn't happen, but we could say that it did. Zach, go on. Sorry. I, I, I love living in fantasy land sometimes, so I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that one that one up. But that was a weird story, James. I, I'm glad I'm glad we got that talked over. It was, a, it was almost like a small uh, character arc over the span of less than 12 hours. Uh, but, yeah, good that he's got gone there on Houston. I'll tell you what, for the Houston part, you know, I'll, I'll bite into your, I'll bite into this bone a little bit, Ref, because I, I think the next step for them is uh, what does the offensive identity look like this season? You know, you have Mark Thompson, of course, who's going to be back, who I think will also still have a massive impact, not only on social media with how he talks, but also how he is on the turf. But I do think the development of Kenji Bahar for you is going to be the greater storyline and who might potentially get picked up by them in the next two phases. I think that's a team that definitely can be one that phase two should be looking at the XFL side or the open perspective of pool that is all eight teams and might pick up someone like a Doherty or like a Jalen McClendon or somebody like that if they are available. Because I think there should be a little competition there even more. I like Kenji. I just think that that's one perspective that could have taken a bit more of a step last season and maybe held them back towards the latter half of the year that didn't let them get to the playoffs over New Orleans. Yeah, he well, definitely had some injuries that that hindered it, but we will note I will note they only have two quarterbacks. UFL teams will select three, so who is the mystery guy? We'll have to see. Maybe it's in the next draft, maybe it's somebody that they're ready to pick up after the draft, but Well, the I'm guy we got to look it. out too is Jared Garantano who signed mm-hmm. the the he signed with the team, he was protected. You know, that's a guy he's been in the NFL, he's been on a couple practice squads, he's been in the preseason for the past couple of years with Denver and Arizona. Had a good career at Tennessee, at, uh, I think Washington, Eastern Washington. Um, 
he's a guy that I think has a lot of potential that could really use the spring league to develop. Will he be able to use the UFL to develop? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but that's right. a guy that really could take take a big step for Houston this year if if Ken G doesn't start. Right on. Mm. Nick, it sounded like you might have had a thought, or I may yeah. have been mistaken. No, uh, when you're talking about the guys who got left behind, um, you guys are all, and, and I think the fan, you know, your guys' fans in general are very familiar with USFL guys. So I figured I'd kind of look at some XFL guys that, mm-hmm. uh, with two guys that, first off, you guys already know, will likely um, cornerback, gambler cornerback, then roughneck cornerback. Does he become right. a again? You know, I hope so. Um, uh, Jeff Bidet is another one um, that people are familiar with, but uh, some guys that I like, I, I think kind of fall under the radar or is just kind of guys I want to see in spring football that haven't really gotten an opportunity. Um, uh, the Seattle backup quarterback, Steven Montez, big, strong quarterback got like two passing attempts all last season. Cause Danucci was incredible, but he's mm-hmm. a guy I really like to see. And then um, Kylan Hill, um, he was a, a pickup this off season um, for the uh, Guardians, uh, didn't get picked. He was a seventh round pick for the Packers, I think, a few years ago that had some draft type that I was really excited to see some of. And then one just oddity is um, Arlington Renegades had a really good secondary last year, did not bring back a single starting corner or DB from last year. It's fascinating. Uh, they Devontae Bosby, Josh Hawkins, Shakira Brown was their three top corners to start out. Um, Hawkins tore his ACL, so you know that, that doesn't shock me as much. And then Joel Powell and Will Hill. Now they're all veteran types, other than Shakira Brown, guys pushing thirty. So maybe it's a lot of retirements, but they're you know that championship team is going to be starting over in the secondary for the most part. Now I do have some insight on Powell because he's actually taking a deeper role with the Carolina Cobras in the National Arena League. Uh, looks like he's exploring more of a coaching side, so that's part of the equation there. Bosby, I'm curious about, though credit, Bosby is a little bit more on the other side of aging in terms of veteran stats. Not saying he can't play, but I do wonder if that's kind of what Stoops, you know, you talk about Hawkins with his injury, you know, Powell moves on, he's looking towards coaching status. Bosby's maybe getting a little more aged out, unfortunately, but it is a part that's going to be unique because they, yeah, rebuilding a secondary, you know, it can be done, but like, you don't often hear of guys saying, let's just get rid of the entire secondary and hit the reset button on that. So, uh, Brawlington's sake, I think uh, good point, Nick. Really great one. That's going to be something to look for, look at as the offseason continues and phase two as well. Right on. Yeah, I know. Phase two is going to be exciting. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll do another live stream. Maybe we'll just wrap it up with a show. We'll have to see. Time will, t- time will tell. Um, I do know, at least tentatively, our next live stream is scheduled for, what is it, January 25th? January 25th, the six years of newsroom live stream. It's crazy. I can't believe it. I was such a young boy. Some, some, some mean son of a gun in the discord commented on my press pass and said, when are you going to update that at picture old man? Wasn't that long ago. All right. Six <laughs> years. Ain't that long. Give me a break. I'm going to hold on to that as long as I can. And you know what? I'm using that same picture again this year. So get over it. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> uh, but six years of newsroom. I mean, just, I don't know what we'll be talking about. I'm sure there's going to be some news. We'll probably reminisce over the times. I don't know. Maybe I'll even do it solo. Maybe I'll have some of you guys on. We'll have to see. We'll have to see where it leads us. Uh, I mean, no curtains. The ref, you know, me, I, uh, I like to do no plans. No plans. Those are the best plans or no plans except for the best plans i do plan i actually don't give myself enough credit like i said spring stock three there's going to be so much planning that goes into spring stock three that you won't want to miss it march 30th arlington texas everything's bigger in texas including spring stock three uh and if you can't make it in arlington we get it we're also going to be live on youtube which if you're not subscribed look below hit the subscribe button click the bell it builds morale. builds morale. I always do this at the end of the video instead of the beginning with these live streams. And it's probably a nice thing to do. I don't, I don't do the shill mode at the beginning, but I will say this every time I ask people, they do it, they do it. So I'm going to ask like the video. It helps us out. If you go ahead, just take a second, like the video. It's going to help the algorithm. Sis, Susan Wojcicki is going to sit there. She's going to get a notification. She's going to say, who's this UFL podcast? 
my god this is amazing put it on the trending page now and that's what we need to happen we need to make it happen because the more people that watch this show hopefully means more people will be tuning in march 30th when this league kicks off either in person or at home both are equally as important uh any i guess final thoughts or any final topics anybody has here before we ride out into the sunset we're we're just about an hour right now on the stream one last thing from me is just i think for every fan out there this is just the beginning uh yeah. these rounds are going to look completely different in a month and they're going to be completely different on week one and then completely different at the end of the season. Yep. It stops. So just because your roster is missing some holes now does not mean that, oh my God, we're going to be bad now. You know, it, 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 this is just the starting point and then now the fun begins. Right on. So I guess what will, oh, Ducky, you, you have something for no, me. No, 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 no. I was just going to tell people to follow Thorne on Twitter if you want any roster information. Well, this yeah, is what I was just go. about to say. I wanted to go around the table and everybody tell everybody that's watching how they can follow you on social media, all of those things. So Thorne, we'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, found out today my handle is uh, <laughs> Thorne 2002. Um, I don't post a ton on twitter but i post all my articles so if you want to see any stuff i'm writing there that's the place to find it right on and thank you again for joining hopefully we'll have you on for more of these like i said we've sure. we 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 did live streams the last couple years but it was more for like the bigger like you know here's spring stock here's summer stock i really want to sprinkle more of these in because i've been having fun this is like our third or fourth one and uh we'll get the i i, I think the audio is good this time so you know what little bits at a time and honestly technical difficulties that's like a newsroom trait i would yeah. never give up a news a technical difficulty if i don't have a technical difficulty i'm a little bit sad there's no joke i did a stream one time and everything was working i had more anxiety uh than like once i found out everything i think zach you were there we had no audio for like f a couple minutes and then once i figured out we had no audio i was so relaxed i was like oh there it is we had a problem now i can like actually enjoy the show um but ducky I, i'm sure everyone knows but tell everyone where can they find you on social media everywhere you should already be following me to be honest and if you're not don't bother following me because <laughs> you should already be following me what's the handle at ducky disguised there you go sign them up go. and if you don't do it we'll find you zach where can they find you at Zach Kyleman, everywhere you want to go. Uh, but yeah, follow the UFO or, oh man, I'm still going to uh -oh. have to go over that. Yes, UFL Podcast. Yes, uh, at UFL Podcast, your favorite platforms, uh, if you want to follow along. I'm good. I'm just going to get over that. Take It's like the New Year thing. I'll get used to it. It's uh, brand new. Be like talking 2023 when it's 2024. Oh, just day. wait, Zach. I'm going to be calling the Roughnecks the Gamblers like probably every show. Somehow, some way, it's going to happen. <laughs> James, my man, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at James Larson PFN. Uh, like Thorne said, my article is obviously on pfnewsroom.com, the leader in spring football news. So make sure you check out that website for all things spring football. Sign you guys up. And again, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks everybody for watching. Like I said, the next stream that we have, at least tentatively, January 25th, six years of newsroom. We'll have more details soon, just like we're going to have more details on spring stock three the biggest party of the spring we're going to be having so much fun up in arlington texas so stay tuned on guests because we have good times good guests and giveaways thanks to vintage varsity but i think that's it folks go enjoy michigan winning the college football championship tonight i know i am go, go blue go sign you go up <laughs>